Hello, uh, I'm Stefan Karpinski. Uh, I'm going to be giving a joint presentation with Viral Shah. Uh, he is the CTO of our company, Julia Computing. I am, I'm the CTO, sorry, he's the CEO. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually more arbitrary than you would think. We, uh, we just, someone, someone had to get the short straw and have to do all the, all the, uh, all the like, administrative stuff and high level work. Um, I get to actually program still, so. Um, yeah, so uh, we actually went to grad school uh, together. We, we played Ultimate Frisbee for a long time before we actually discovered that we had uh, research interests in common. We were doing non-negative matrix factorization, which uh, back, you know, back before you know, deep learning and recursive neural networks was one of the darling machine learning uh, techniques of like, you know, the late 2000s. Um, and so I was doing data science and machine learning, and I had this sort of horrendous data science stack going on that I will just briefly describe to you. Um, in a single project, I was using MATLAB for linear algebra because it's really the, you know, at the time it was the best thing you could do for that kind of, kind of work. Uh, I was using R for st stats and visualization because I think it makes the best plots. Um, and it's, you know, the undisputed king in, in statistical analysis. Uh, but some of the stuff was just really not fast enough in either of those languages or any lang high level language. So you had to go to C. You had to like write some really fast, you know, usually kind of nasty C code, but it got the performance you needed. And then finally, because I was doing all of this on a big cluster and shuffling files and sockets around and throwing it into a database and trying to figure out what I needed to recompute when, I used Ruby to tie it all together. Um, and this all worked but I felt like I had created a bit of a monstrosity. A group, I don't know if people are familiar with Rube Goldberg, He's this artist who would draw these like crazy contraptions, like you know, this guy eats some soup and then you know, it uh, you know, pops up a piece of toast and the parrot eats it and eventually it like cools off his soup. Um, and that's what I felt like I was working with. So I was, we were tossing around a disc one day and I was complaining to Veral about how ridiculous this setup was and how there had to be a better way to do things where you didn't have to program in you know, half a dozen different languages to get things done. And he said, you know, you should meet this guy, Jeff Bazanson, that I know who has been talking to, about to me about the same exact thing for years. Uh, and we all started talking and we decided to create a new programming language because that seems sane. Um, but here we are eight years later uh, and we actually have had a, quite a bit of success. Um, in retrospect, we identified what we call now the, the two-language problem. Um, and this is also known as Osterhout's dichotomy, except John Osterhout actually thought it was a good thing. Uh, we think it's not the best thing, but you know, it's debatable. So basically, this is the observation that programming languages come in two varieties, systems languages and then scripting languages. And they're you know, static versus dynamic, compiled versus interpreted, user types versus standard types, that's sort of like, do you have a couple of standard types that are really useful, but like you can't really make user-defined types that are as good as those? Or do you have to roll everything yourself, but everything is just as good? Um, and then you have fast versus slow, and hard versus easy. And this is sort of, you know, when he had made this observation in the early 90s, this was the state of the art. This is how things were. Um, a lot of people working on programming languages are trying to like break this divide now, and by creating the Julia programming language, this is one of the things we're, we're very much trying to do. Um, and this is, you know, this is, this is I'll, I'll talk about how we unify this, but this dichotomy, you know, that he observed is actually, has led to a, a pretty standard compromise in systems. And it's actually, it's actually very pragmatic. So for convenience, you use a high level language like Python or MATLAB or R. Um, but then for all the hard stuff that needs to be really fast, you use a systems language like C or C++ or Fortran. And like, you know, 90% of systems work this way. This is, this is, I've built tons of systems this way. You know, if you've used NumPy or MATLAB or, you know, R, this is exactly how they all work. Um, it's really pragmatic, but it has some problems. It's not an ideal world. So aren't the hard parts exactly where you'd want a better programming language? So it's kind of crazy that just when things get really tough and it's like, oh, I gotta solve this really hard problem, it's gotta be really fast. Now I end up programming in a programming language that has like no support whatsoever and lets me just seg fault whenever I feel like it because I made a slight error. Um, so it'd be really nice if we could program in an easier programming language when we're doing really hard things. Um, 
if you've programmed in these numerical systems, you will remember that like you just have to do vectorization all the time, which you know in its best form means like I've got a matrix A and a matrix B, and to add them, all I have to do is write A plus B, and you're like, oh, that was easy, that was great. But in its worst forms, you know, you have some sparse matrix and you have some transformation you have to do on it. And, you know, instead of the like nice for loop that you'd like to write, you end up doing some crazy thing where you have to extract all sorts of index values and, you know, it's, it just gets, it gets very nasty very quick. Um, so sometimes it's really awkward and it's also always pretty wasteful because you keep creating these intermediate arrays whenever you do vectorized form. So that would be nice to address. Um, it also creates a social barrier. This is a really interesting observation that I, I, I noticed when I was at the, uh, in the NumPy conference giving a talk on Julia. Um, and I realized that even when we were one year into being a public project, we already had more contributors and developers than NumPy. And I could not understand how that was possible because I was like, we're this very young project. This was you know, back in 2013. Um, and it's because, you know, to be a contributor to NumPy, you need to know Python, you need to know C, you need to know Python C internals, you need to know a lot about numerical computing, you need to know about how NumPy, it's like, you know, this long list of things that has a tiny intersection of people who can actually do all of it. To program in Julia and be a contributor to it, if you're a user, you are automatically every day practicing to be, become, like, competent to contribute to, like, any package. Um, Recently, with the advent, like advent of a lot of these, you know, fairly sophisticated AI frameworks, many of which have, uh, you know, like TensorFlow has a, Py a Python interface. Um, um, PyTorch is also becoming very popular. Um, they have what I've, I would describe as a sandwich problem, which is that you end up sandwiching a lot of system code with user code, and then like adding more and more layers of that, and as you sandwich like you know seven or eight layers of that. You know, you might be doing a really trivial operation, but it can't be collapsed because every time you hit that barrier where you switch languages, there is no possibility for optimization. So if all of that is in one system and in one language, you might be able to see like, oh yeah, these like 15 layers of operations going between user and system code are actually just doing, describing an addition. That's it, and you can eliminate it all if it's all in one language and you have a, a good optimizer. Um, so this is the, the Julian unification of Osterholz dichotomy, is that the programming language is dynamic, it's compiled, it lets you have user and standard types, and it's fast and it's easy. So there are other ways to unify this, but this is what we have found to be pragmatic. Um, and so, you know, the, the real thing that I think gets a lot of people to come to the language uh, is the performance. So this is a, a, some, there's some micro benchmarks you can dither around about, you know, whether the benchmarks are representative or not. They're not, they're micro benchmarks. But the real life, life experience of what people have done, you know, in like, you know, years of programming in Julia now, is that they, they tend to see that Julia is within one to two fact of, of C. Uh, and that's, that's our sweet spot, that's where we wanna be. Uh, this is a log scale on the, on the Y axis and just different languages on the X axis. So, you know, if you're, if you're up here, this is, this is pretty bad. That's like thousands of times slower than C. Um, and you know, MATLAB and, and Octave are, are in that regime. Um, so what, what, I, what I actually think is much more important though is this speed versus productivity idea. So, you know, you, traditionally you can be fast or you can be productive, but not both at the same time. And we wanna be in this like sweet spot corner where you're fast and you're productive at the same time. And I think that's the real killer feature. We've had the ability to write fast code forever. You know, Fortran was always supposed to be a really, really fast numerical language. But now you can be really, really productive and really fast at the same time. Uh, so, you know, these days, this is what my, I don't do much data science anymore now that I'm running a company, but you know, uh, now I use Julia for linear algebra and I use Julia for stats and visualization and for the fast stuff and to tie it all together. Um, so I think uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Viral. All right, um, so Stefan gave uh, you know, the introduction to why Julia and how we came about with it. And I'm going to just very quickly go through a few of the use cases, like you know, this is great, like a new programming language, you would gotta be crazy to create one. Well, we kinda did and you know, we've come this far, but the question is, apart from us, who uses this thing? Um, why this seems like it's on auto or something. Thank you. 
So this is a, a picture of the GitHub stars from the Julia project. And you know we have uh, sort of people working on Julia in just about every time zone. And uh, I actually wanted to you know, say hi to Harlan out here. So Harlan's one of our uh, you know, earliest contributors. He wrote much of the data ecosystem in Julia called Data Frames now, and he's one of those dots in the, in the Washington DC area. Uh, now New York, I guess, but um, um, there's people coming from all around the world, and we've, we've had over 1.2 million downloads until today, even though the research is anchored at MIT. It's a truly open source project. Um, we've had contributions to the core language from over, um, I keep losing track of the count. I think it's eight, 800 people now, close to, yeah. 800 people, there are 1,600 contributed Julia packages. But people keep coming up to us and be like, oh, but you know, R has 6,000, or you know, JavaScript has a bazillion or something. And um, you know, the thing is that you could call each and every single Python package from Julia, each and every R package from Julia, each and every Java library from Julia, each and every C or C++ or Fortran library ever written from Julia in an easier and a better way than you could um, in, you know, from many other uh, systems. And that is really powerful. Um, you know, so my real answer is it's not just 1,600 packages, but we have tens of thousands of packages uh, that you could use. Um, quickly jumping across industries, uh, you know, this is great. It's an amazing open source community, but what are people really using it for? Like, does anyone use it for production? That's another question that often comes up. Um, the New York Fed uses Julia to model the US economy. The Federal Aviation Administration, if you ever take a flight, and I think everyone in this room takes a flight probably several times a year. Um, the collision avoidance systems on every aircraft uh, that are specified by the FAA um, are now going to be specified in Julia. Uh, there's a research group at Berkeley that writes all their self-driving car software in Julia, and uh, you know there's, there's folks doing 3D printing with it. Um, another common question, what do people, you know, what about machine learning, what about GPUs? Apart from CUDA and C, the toolkits that NVIDIA puts out, Julia is the only other you know, widely used language that has native CUDA code gen. So you can actually write your programs in Julia and uh, deploy them onto the GPUs without knowing any C or C++. Um, and on top of that, there are various abstractions. So while you could use all the usual machine learning libraries in Julia, um, you could actually just roll out your own and often writing uh, you know, a simple deep learning uh, network or a convolutional neural net is a few lines of code. You don't even need a TensorFlow if you're using Julia. All right, so taking all this together, you know, uh, one of the earliest pro uh, projects that we started on, um, this started about a couple of years ago, uh, this is actually a, an astronomy application, so mapping out the whole sky. There are about 180 million light sources that the um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, identifies, and that adds up to about 56 petabytes of data. And um, to process this entire thing, we ran the whole uh, program on 650,000 cores. It was run on this machine called Cori, uh, which was a top, which is a top five supercomputer, um, running 1.3 million threads. This was using AVX 512 in order to achieve the, the peak flop rate and we got to 1.6 petaflops. It was a six organization collaboration, but actually it was more like one person from each of those organizations. So it's, it's actually a pretty small team that uh, wrote this amazing scientific uh, application. It is one of the largest mathematical optimization problems ever done, uh, ever solved. It's uh, you know, solving an uncertainty, a mathematical uncertainty problem over 180 million uh, light sources. Um, that's great academia, but what about you know, business and uh, you know, industry? So Aviva, one of the largest insurers in Europe, uses Julia for all of their regulatory uh, reporting around solvency too. Um, the Brazilian National Bank uses um, Julia to manage all of its trillion dollars in assets. So every morning, you know, the regulatory reports that their directors look at for the solvency of the bank are computed using Julia and Jump, um, which I'll come to later. Um, We've, uh, we've worked with uh, an eye hospital in Bangalore to you know, do the diabetic retinopathy thing. We published this actually just a couple of weeks before Google announced it, but once Google announced it, I think uh, we kind of lost the opportunity to get the press around it. Um, another uh, amazing healthcare uh, application in systems biology. Uh, uh, this is a very simple uh, set of um, systems biology simulations, 745 times faster than R. So everyone thinks, you know, Stefan talked about the two language problem up 
you know, straightforward, simple translation of the R code into Julia, and, and you know, just putting in a little bit of effort into making it Julian gives you this amazing speed up. More applications in personalized medicine, operations research. Actually, I'd maybe just take a second here before I finish up. Jump is an amazing mathematical optimization framework. So if you're on Wall Street, if you're you know, in finance, in, um, um, in insurance, or working on anything that involves mathematical optimization, Jump is your framework of choice. Um, these are all the applications that people have already used Jump for. And it's by far better than any commercial system out there. And it's actually um, a domain-specific language in Julia. So it makes it possible for anyone to write a mathematical optimization problem in a high-level language and then use either a commercial or open source solver in the background. Um, if you know what any of this stuff means or if any of those uh, acronyms mean in the table out there, you should absolutely go and try out Jump. I personally do not know what all those acronyms mean except for the first two columns. Um, so to end this presentation, you know, I'm gonna take this quote from Paul Graham. If you have a choice of several languages, it is all other things being equal, a mistake to program in anything but the most powerful one. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do I? Thank you very much. Or is it gonna yes. interfere? I guess you're the CEO, so you get the seat. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. That's awesome and very impressive as well. Um, let's talk about the business aspect of this just for a minute. Uh, how do you, I guess there's one very illustrious precedent, but how do you build a, a business on top of an open source language? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an ongoing open problem, right? Like, and I think the only thing that we know so far is that no two open source companies are alike. And you know, people often talk of like consulting is a way to build an open source business, but it's obviously not because you don't want your core devs to be consulting when you really need to be building the product. Um, open core models don't work very well because the community that was, you know, uh, sort of uh, going with you starts hating you because all the good stuff is not there anymore. What we've decided is to keep Julia completely open source and we are actually one of the largest contributors to it. Uh, but the way we make money is by making it easy to use Julia. So all the plumbing around Julia, you know, deployment on the cloud, all the compilation, all the hard work that nobody really wants to do, but they really want to focus on their data science problems or their AI problems, um, and then leave sort of all the deployment and the grunge work to someone else. We kind of come in and fill in that entire plumbing, and that's, uh, you know, one of the systems we offer commercially. It's called Julia Run. Um, so Julia Run is the deployment system. We have Julia Box, which is more of a of an interactive platform um, that you can use to run Julia on the cloud. So, so the plumbing is our business model. <laughs> <laughs> I will reuse this. Um, and, and it's all out, it's, it's all available, because you, you guys haven't been doing, I mean, the, the, the effort has been around for a while, but as a company, you haven't been around that long, right? Close to about two years now, and you know, like you mentioned in your announcement, we just uh, announced our first round of seed capital. Um, some of, uh, so Julia Pro, which is one of our products, is already out, but Julia Pro is basically selling support of the open source Julia ecosystem and making it easy to download and install in corporate settings. What we really think you know, is gonna be our scalable product is Julia Run, which is you know, what I call plumbing, and that's, gonna, that's already out in beta with uh, some of our early customers and is going to be available uh, for sort of um, wide scale use uh, in the next couple of months. Great, um, let me open up. Questions, we have one right here. Where does the name come from? <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering the same, actually. I, That's, I, I used Julie before, and like, okay. when I first downloaded it, I was like, this is great. Where but does where the does the name come, come from? from? So curious about that for Sorry? years now. <laughs> In 1984. <laughs> I, that's a question we usually never answer, so maybe, maybe you know, when, when the bar's open. <laughs> I'm curious to know, people uh, are using Python a lot because the libraries are so feature-rich, it, it uh, lets you write with less code, so how far will Julia go to that extent? So Julia can actually use all the Python libraries by simply just importing them. So you can, you know, we have a package called PyCall, and you know, if you just say using PyCall import a Python package by name, it's gonna bring all those Python libraries into your Julia environment. 
So you can get the benefit of using everything that is out there in the Python world, but then not having to sort of go down to the low levels in C for performance reasons. So you can stay in Julia, write all your Julia code, and bring in Python as you need to. If you're using these Python libraries, though, I assume you're not getting the performance enhancements of the Julia, correct? Um, I'm gonna just, so I can see you, yeah. Um, if you're using the Python libraries, yes. Well, if the Python libraries are written in C under the hood, you're getting the performance of those C libraries. But you're not getting the benefits of parallelizing them or maybe automatically putting them on GPUs as Julia can do. So you're getting essentially what you would have got in Python. The only reason you'd call the Python libraries from Julia is if you have a large project and there are a couple specific point uh, functionalities that you need from them. But you're pretty much giving up on the benefits of Julia if you know, you're using Julia as a Python wrapper. How do you continue building the community around the world, do you guys, at a, at a very practical level? I'm always amazed by successful open source projects. Do you do meetups everywhere? We're actually pretty bad at doing this. I would love to be, you know, hosting Julia meetups of this size. Uh, you know, all of us would love to, right? But We've, we've done lots of conferences. Uh, actually, the way Julia has spread, uh, if, if you'd ask me, is a lot of conferences and a lot of academia. So a lot of researchers using Julia, spreading it around the universities, people graduating, taking it to work with them. Um, and it's, it's very grassroots. So, but we are now kind of beginning to leverage PyData, which is, an, you know, we are part of the NumFocus Foundation. Um, so along with NumPy and, you know, variety of Python software packages. Python mathematical software packages, Julia is also in the same umbrella. And we are leveraging PyData, which is one of their conferences to you know, have Julia come out in front of more people. We're kind of making that jump, I would think, from the early users or the early adopters to sort of the mainstream users, so, or from researchers into industry. And I think a lot of what you're sort of suggesting is, is what we need to do next. Very good, one last question here. Just a follow-up on the question of how would you go from being, say, a Python user or a user to uh, being a Julia user? Do you have any kind of tools that are available to kind of intelligently trans translate, translate okay. code from, <laughs> say, R or Python to Julia so that you could kind of then take advantage of essentially compiling it? So people often ask us this question that can I translate my code from you know, one particular language to another? And I think Stefan might have a different answer slightly than me, but let me give my version. Um, we usually, I mean, so it, it may be possible to write one. It's not easy because converting you know, one dynamic language to another one is, is quite hard. But the benefits of Julia come from being Julian. So if you take a vectorized you know, algorithm in Python or R and convert it to a vectorized implementation in Julia, you may not get the benefits. If your you know, algorithm had uh, type instabilities, which often is the case in many dynamic languages, it won't work in Julia, you need to fix them. You know, if you want your code to be sort of you know, running on multiple architectures, writing it in the Julia way uh, gives you um, a lot of stuff to work with. But you know, Stefan spoke about the user-defined data types, right? So you just don't have those things in Python or R. I think if you just do a line-by-line -line translation of an existing algorithm into Julia from another language, you're probably not going to gain the richness and the benefits of being in Julia. I'll give you one simple example. Like in Julia, you can have uh, variables that are Unicode, you know, uh, variables, right? So, so alpha can be literally alpha, right? So in, in the Julia REPL, if you type slash alpha and press tab, you will get the, the Greek letter alpha, um, which is valid in Julia. Or you can have, you know, if you're a Chinese programmer, you could have Chinese characters, for example. Um, you can't do that in many of the other systems, so, I, I think my personal recommendation is, you know, bite the bullet and do it. The tools that we do provide are, are interoperability. So start out by translating a little bit, and then, you know, you have the bridge to call Python or R. Yeah, I, I guess my, my take on this is that uh, translation, lo, lo, you know, you look at one piece of dynamic language code and you sort of transliterate it as a human and it looks very similar. Um, a lot of our early adopters were actually people who tried that coming from R or Python and were like, oh, hey, this just got like 300 times faster. Wow, that's like magic. Um, and so they come for the performance, they stick around for some of the other features, but, uh, but it's, it's deceptively 
hard to do. Humans are really good at that sort of thing. Um, the trouble is when you get into automatic translation, it's always the corner cases that kill you. Uh, and the corner cases that kill you with automatic translation are actually exactly the reasons why you can't just sit down and be like, oh, well, let's just make Python like 100 times faster. Um, so we, what we could do is we could make a translator that sort of does what, you know, roughly you would think you would do and then works like 80% of the time. Um, I think that would be a bad experience. Yeah. Um, if, we, if we could translate Python to Julia 100% accurately, then we could just make Python run faster. If that makes sense, right? So. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.